This is a WVVA news special, Facts Not Fear, in the two Virginias, answering your questions about the coronavirus. Good evening, and thank you for joining us. I'm Martin Staunton, and welcome to WVVA's third special on COVID-19 called Facts Not Fear. Coronavirus cases worldwide have now surpassed 3 million. That's double the cases from April the 8th when we aired our second show. Then those cases had only passed 1.5 million. And when we had our first Facts Not Fear broadcast back on March 18th, the worldwide cases were just at 200,000. So tonight we're hosting our third installment of this 30 minute special facts not fear we have a panel of three medical experts here to answer your questions joining us tonight on this panel includes dr yoginder yadav a hospitalist specialist with princeton community hospital dr john tursky the third is also joining us he's a primary care physician with the bland county medical clinic in bastion virginia and he's an er doctor with the with county community hospital and our third guest there in the middle is sabrina huffman she's a family nurse practitioner in bluefield west virginia with bluestone health let me thank all of you for taking your time to be with us and answer these questions our first one comes from a viewer pamela tuggle who asks how accurate is the test for COVID-19? Uh, there are two main kinds of tests that we use. Uh, first one detects viral RNA and there's a PCR test. It is highly accurate, uh, especially when it's collected from the nasopharynx. The specificity is a little bit lower when it's collected from oropharynx. It reaches almost 100% sensitivity uh, if it's a nasopharyngeal specimen. The second test that is used is the viral antibody test. That becomes positive after about 14 days and has sensitivity only of about 90%. We still don't know how best to utilize that. Uh, more information is needed on the viral antibody test. Um, let me ask a follow-up question. Does the antibody test mean that you've actually had COVID-19 if you test positive for the antibodies? Yes, it does tell that you have had prior exposure to COVID-19. There are two antibodies, IgM and IgG, that is used, and both become positive by about 14 days. Okay, Dr. Tursky, let me ask you this question. Another viewer writes, when a person tests positive for asymptomatic virus, what does that mean? Does that person always have that virus in their system, or does that person actually shed the virus after a month or so? Well, that test that positive test would certainly mean that they had been exposed to it um, that they were testing positive for it and that for a period of time uh, and we're suggesting two to 14 days that if they're asymptomatic but they're positive for it uh, that they consider that they can be shedding the the virus um, in terms of shedding it for a longer period of time. I don't know that we have any studies that show that. So I think after 14 days, if, if they were asymptomatic, um, we'd probably be recommending the same kind of social distancing precautions that we suggest to everybody. Okay, when COVID-19, the next question again from a viewer when a COVID-19 patient dies does the virus also die with them or are we contaminating the air in the ground with the disposal of the bodies um, for most pathogens that affect humans uh, they don't live long after a person's death so the contamination of soil or air it is not a high concern at that point. Uh, standard precautions should be used in handling body after death. Okay, um, the next question I'm going to direct to um, Sabrina Hoffman. Um, can you talk to us about the process of the test? Is this an invasive process or is it pretty quick? Um, it doesn't take very long at all. It is a little invasive um, because it is a nasopharyngeal swab. So the it's like a cotton tip applicator or some form like that, it, but it does, does go pretty far back into the nose. So some patients find that just a little aggravating or uncomfortable, but it's just for a few seconds and um, then the test is over. Oh, so it's that test where they 
uh, and I'm going to use super layman terms here, they stick the Q-tip all the way in the back of your nose. Yes. Does that hurt? I've never had that. You know, we don't have patients that have been tested. They don't leave crying or, or think that they've been to the torture chamber that it may okay. seem like. But um, but it, it is a little uncomfortable. It makes the nose itch and makes them want to sneeze. But other than that, they, it's not very painful. Um, the next question is, is there a possibility of COVID-19 virus transferring from infected workers to the meats and the packing plants, you know, we keep hearing about this in the news and it impacting the food supply. What, what do you guys know about it being passed from infected workers to the actual food? And I'm, I'm going to say that um, I think if they were following the usual procedures and precautions at the meat packing plant, uh, it would be really unlikely to get that virus in the meat. But even if it were, um, even if we weren't in the middle of this pandemic, we as healthcare professionals would be recommending uh, proper cooking and preparing of, of that meat. So I certainly think that if it's gone through the cooking process and the preparation, that someone who consumes it isn't going to be getting a viable virus. So, so, so the heat, if you cook to the proper temperatures, I guess, you know, 185 for meats is 165, I guess, um, kills that virus. Yes. The only thing I will add to that is most transmission for COVID-19 is person to person, though some transmission from contaminated surfaces described, there is no report of foodborne transmission at this point. Okay, thank you for that. Next question, since the arrival of the virus, the scientific community, the medical community, and the government have all called this a learning curve. If the virus returns in the fall, like predicted, will we be better prepared to handle such a large outbreak like it is now, or will we still be dealing with the crippling effects of this one? Uh, from a medical standpoint, I think we will be better prepared. We should have ample testing. Uh, and we should be investing this time in stockpiling for personal protective equipment for a possible second wave. Um, I don't know, Dr. Dersky, would you like to add to that? Um, no, I, I certainly agree. Uh, we may have been caught with not as much protective equipment as we would have liked to have had and not having testing ramped up. Um, you know, we hope not to have another wave of this, but I think we've been told to expect at least some. And, and I think we're going to be much better prepared the next, the next time. Yes. Yes. All right. Um, we're going to use this point to take a break right now. You're watching Facts Not Fear. It's a coronavirus special. We'll be right back. Welcome back. You're watching Facts, not fear. It's a coronavirus special here in the two Virginias. We've got a panel of three medical experts and who are feeling questions from our viewers and we'll roll right on to the next one. So one viewer writes, if I were admitted to a hospital in the Bluefield Princeton area and I am in critical condition with COVID-19, are there any drugs or treatments that would be administered to possibly help in my recovery? If not, why not? And does the patient have any input as to whether or not the drug or treatment should be used? Uh, yes, uh, we have several treatment options that are being looked into. Uh, hydroxychloroquine is one of them, azithromycin is another. Remdesivir, which is antiviral that is being looked into and it shows promising results. Uh, treatment options are available at Princeton and Bluefield and yes, you do not have to ask for them, though individual treatment decision should be made in consultation with your physician. And I'm, I'm going to jump in that I know over in um, our Virginia area and, and certainly right where I practice that patient's going to probably get transferred to a tertiary center, but some of our tertiary centers in the area are also using convalescent plasma. Yes. Uh, I've heard a lot about plasma in the news donated by people who've recovered from that. How does that plasma help a person who's just been diagnosed? Uh, plasma we are taking from a person who has had infection have, and has developed antibodies 
So essentially, we are using that to fight infection in severe cases. The limitation of using convalescent plasma is, one, the supply, and then you're using a human product. Uh, and to use in vast amount of patients, it, it's, it has limitations. So ideally, we need to come up with an antiviral drug that would be easily administered to vast majority of patients. Um, Sabrina, for the folks that are coming through Bluestone, especially those who are looking to be testing, how, what can you tell us about how worried they seem? Um, it seems like that would be an anxious waiting period from the time I give the swab to the actual turnaround with the test result. Yes, naturally people are scared that, you know, they think that they may have it. They've met the symptom criteria to be tested and so that it is very worrisome to them. I try to give them um, some education um, during the testing process. I also do treat them with azithromycin, which is an antibiotic, and even though I don't have the test results back yet, I go ahead and give them that treatment because if they are positive, then they will ha we haven't had a delay in their treatment. And if they're negative, that antibiotic is used to treat other infections such as strep throat and some types of pneumonia. So it is a good antibiotic to use even if they test negative. So that does give them some sense of security that at least they are already getting the proper treatment. Okay, thank you. We've got another question from a viewer, Phyllis Sneed writes, and I want all three of you to kind of weigh in on this. Phyllis writes that the airwaves are full of advertisements for all sorts of medications that are immune suppressors. I have asthma and my doctor wanted to prescribe one of these for me. I was diagnosed around the time of a flu vaccine shortage. I decided I might not need an immune system, so I declined that medication. Is the prevalence of all these immune suppressors part of the reason why so many are dying from COVID-19? And will the use of these drugs prevent people from getting a vaccine once one is finally developed? Uh, while the mortality may seem higher in elderly patients and uh, patients that are taking immunosuppressive medicines, most vaccines can be administered to those taking immunosuppressive drugs. As specifically for COVID-19, we don't know yet what kind of vaccine will be developed. There are certain kind of vaccines uh, that are contraindicated in patients who are taking immunosuppressive drugs. So, when more information is available, we'll be able to better answer that question. And I think right now they're, they're working very hard to try to collect data on all the people who've been severely affected so we can try to see if there's any factors that have made folks more susceptible. Because we all know the, the people who are very, very elderly or very debilitated are susceptible, but this also affects kind of random people at other ages, uh, and, and we don't have really links. Uh, the question uh, makes me think the answer so far uh, for using those medications to help other conditions, and we've also been asked about certain blood pressure medicines um, and the non-steroidal anti-inflammatory medicines being associated with a bad outcome, that the most important thing is, is your doctor recommending that for the condition that you already have? Because I think they're telling us, don't stop medicines that are helping people otherwise, otherwise especially until we get the data. Yes. I'm going to move to this next question. Um, uh, I'll direct it to you, Sabrina. It's from Loretta Faye Sizemore. She says, if you haven't had the virus and you have not been tested yet, but you want to get tested, what can you do? Um, right now we are still testing mainly the people that have symptoms. That is still the most high risk population. So if you are symptomatic, you have fever, cough, shortness of breath, then you should come and get tested. We are testing at the clinic Monday through Friday. Um, and the health department, the Mercer County Health Department is having their drive-through testing on Tuesdays and Thursdays and Princeton Hospital is still testing people with a doctor's order. So there's plenty of opportunity if you are symptomatic that you could come and be tested. If you're not symptomatic, then 
you don't need to be tested at this time. Um, I, the governor has opened it up to test people, certain populations trying to get the state back to um, opening, but right now we're only testing the people that are symptomatic other than the ones that the governor has asked us to test like residents of the nursing home and staff and then next week child care workers um, otherwise just symptomatic patients but we do have the IgG blood test that tests for the antibodies so if you are not sick now but think that you have had the coronavirus um, two weeks ago or two months ago then you could come and see your primary care provider and get the blood test for that. And Sabrina, we were talking just before um, we went on the air that a person like say I came in and I tested today and I test negative. How does that give me a false sense of I'm safe? Well, that does go back to the reason why we don't want to test someone who isn't symptomatic because if I test you today and you are healthy and you get a negative result, then it gives you a false sense of security to think that you don't have the coronavirus and so you can go out and visit who you want and go to stores and that you won't be spreading it to someone. But you were only negative for that moment and five minutes later you could have come in contact with someone who had it. and. Two days later, you could be developing symptoms. So it doesn't necessarily mean that just because you didn't have it yesterday that you won't have it today. Or tomorrow. Yes. All right. Um, the next question is from Lucille Sisk. She writes, my question involves Governor Justice's reopening plan. When can those over 65 or have an underlying condition return to their life? Um. Specifically, I did not see anything in governor's plan that addressed uh, most vulnerable of our population that when stay-at-home orders will be lift, lifted. Uh, but I think it will be data-driven. When infection rates are low, then with some social distancing, I think that should be allowed. Do you, how do you feel, Dr. Tursky, um, about that? Well, I, when I considered that question, I thought as a 66-year-old <laughs> with grandchildren, um, it, it's going to partially be informed by, by what the governor says, and it's going to be partially informed by personal choice. Um, I think it's probably going to be a good idea to do some really sensible distancing for the foreseeable future, I because agree. like it or not, we're going to be living with this virus for some time. And, and no matter what age you are I th and however long the social distancing lasts, I think the thing that we should remember and continue to practice as a community is good hygiene, good hand washing and um, you know cleaning with the cleaning supplies like Clorox and, and things that will kill not only the coronavirus but other viruses as well. We should continue with those safe practices. All right, thank you. We're going to take a break right now, and we'll be back when Facts Not Fear continues. Welcome back to Facts Not Fear in the Two Virginias. It's a coronavirus special with a panel of medical experts. We're taking questions from our viewers that have been emailed in, and we're going to go right into the next question, which is, how fine of a filter do you need to wear to stop the virus? Do you need a complete seal around your nose and your mouth? Uh, we have to go back to understand what is the filter is being, uh, what is the mask is being used for. Uh, mask for general public is intended that we don't spread the virus to others. We don't need a complete seal around the mouth. Uh, the, the respirator masks like N95 are for special occasions in the sense that only uh, medical professionals are using it when they are exposed to aerosolized uh, virus. Uh, so for general public, I think any kind of cloth mask, homemade mask should be sufficient uh, so we don't spread the virus to others. And the N95 masks that he was talking about that the healthcare providers wear we are fitted for those masks to make sure that there is a tight seal around the mouth and, and we get a fit test so that we make sure that we're not smelling or, or breathing in particles to make sure that the mask, the size mask that we wear is sufficient. I tell most of my, my 
patients, it's probably not healthy to be thinking about walking around in public with an N95 mask. Um, it's certainly appropriate for us if we're taking care of somebody who's got the coronavirus or, or may be infected, but we're wearing those other face covers, the, the cloth masks, mm -hmm. to protect each other. When I put that on my face, it keeps me from spreading coronavirus to you. Yes. Absolutely. So we're not necessarily wearing those face coverings to filter out the virus. Because I'd imagine that'd have to be a pretty small particle filter to um, block viruses from entering the lung. Yeah, I mean, th those are special masks, as I discussed earlier. When we come into contact with uh, aerosolized virus, then yes, we do have to wear that. But even taking care of patients uh, for routine visits, we don't need to wear N95 mask. Now, our next question, and we kind of touched on this off subject, um, off the air a little bit, but um, no name associated with it. It just asks, why don't President Trump and Governor Justice wear a mask in their briefings? Your thoughts on that? Um, I, I would think as long as they're doing proper social distancing, they probably don't need to wear. Uh, but for general public, if, if social distancing is not possible, masks are advised. So the mask is if you're going to be closer than six feet to a person, you should probably have that. Yes. Um, also on the subject of the masks, I've also seen reports that, you know, the masks not only prevent you from spreading it to someone else, but it helps with that whole habit we all have of touching our face. It provides some protection there. Can you talk about that? Yeah, it does tend to, pro does tend to provide that uh, protection that we don't touch our face constantly. Uh, but like Sabrina was saying, there's no substitute to proper hand hygiene. So we need to remind ourselves constantly to wash hands as frequently as possible, and uh, when we cannot maintain social distances, distancing to wear some kind of mask. Otherwise, social distancing is going to be key for foreseeable future. All right, the next question comes to us from Patricia Duddleson. She asks, how safe are we going to be when the economy begins to reopen? Isn't there a chance of it spreading even more after opening the state back up? Uh, as long as we follow social distancing, I think we will be okay. Plus, the, the, the curve we have had in the state, it's flattened. So the number of cases, new cases we are seeing are very few. Uh, but we cannot let our guard down at this point. Uh, otherwise, yes, there can be resurgence if we don't take proper precautions. I think it's going to be really important as doctor said, for people not to forget, and as Sabrina said, not to forget to, to wash, wash our hands, to keep our Absolutely. hands off our faces, to mask if we're going to be close to people. I think we're going to be living with that for some time. Still a vaccine is available, yeah. probably. And I was reading a news report today that there's an antiviral that's showing real promise in treating COVID-19. Can any of you talk about what this is and how this antiviral medication would work? Yeah, that is remdesivir. We touched base on that a little bit earlier. That is antiviral that has been used. Uh, we have read case reports of that is in, uh, that being used in different ICUs uh, in critical patients. Uh, there is more literature coming out that it is, uh, it is showing promising result, but some more peer review needs to be done uh, on those studies. Uh, but it is showing much more promising results than other treatments we talked about earlier. And um, we have just a few more minutes left. I want to jump back in there with Sabrina. And again, Sabrina, can you remind folks about the testing that is out there if people are worried about having coronavirus? Yes, if you are symptomatic with fever, shortness of breath, cough, then you should seek testing. And there are opportunities for testing at the Bluestone clinics, and there are five Bluestone clinics, um, the one in Kegley, one in Princeton, um, one in uh, Montcalm and Bluefield. There, um, we all offer the testing, but also the Mercer County Health Department offers testing at the drive-through on Tuesdays and Thursdays. And then the Princeton Hospital, if you have a 
physician's order from your PCP, then you could get the test as well. So it is still necessary if you are showing symptoms to get the test so that we know who out there in our community has the virus. However, if um, you are sick and you test negative, then we still are recommending that you quarantine until you are symptom and fever free for three days on the off chance that you won't pass it to someone else. Okay, and Dr. Tursky, um, I'll throw this last question at you. Talk about contact tracing. How important is that work in terms of finding out if there are other infections in the community? Well, I think that's gonna be extremely important as we get out of this, what they've called mitigation part um, into to trying to keep things under control in the next stage. Um, and, and as testing becomes more available and we can find out who is testing positive, then being able to trace that back and, and the folks who've been in contact with that person uh, will make it very possible to prevent the next uh, big outbreak. Yeah, testing and isolate will be the key. And on testing, we are starting to see some rapid tests become available with results as quickly as 90 minutes. So hopefully more of those will be available to general public soon. All right, thank you so much, Dr. Tursky, Dr. Yadif, and Sabrina Huffman. All three of you were great. You did a wonderful job and we can't thank you enough. You've been watching Facts Not Fear, a coronavirus special in the two Virginias. I'm Martin Staunton. Thank you for joining us.